Welcome to the GeoFlow video series, Making Geothermal Easier. In this video, we'll be discussing flushing and purging concepts of geothermal closed-loop systems. We'll also address reducing headers and their effect on flushing and purging. Thank you for joining us. Our topics include the goals for loop flushing and purging of the system, which includes the reasons for removing air and debris from the system. We'll also discuss flushing requirements for velocity through the system and flush cart equipment requirements. The topic, but wait, even before flushing, addresses reducing headers and their importance in loop flushing and purging air from the system. Once you've reviewed this video on flushing and purging concepts, you'll find other videos on GeoFlow's YouTube channel on flush cart operation. Let's begin. Let's talk about the goals of flushing a ground loop first. Many of us in the industry just take it for granted that the loop must be flushed. However, we should consider the reasons and discuss the potential issues with a ground loop that has not been properly purged of air and flushed of debris. The first goal we need to accomplish is removal of air from the system. We also need to remove any debris that may have been introduced during installation, such as soil or pipe shavings. Then the flush cart can assist in adding antifreeze to the system and or water treatment chemicals. Removal of air and debris is so important because of the pump design used for most geothermal systems. Wet rotor circulators are very common in the geothermal industry. This type of pump is cooled and lubricated by the fluid circulating through the system. As you can see from the picture, the passageways are very small and the clearances are tight so any debris can cause premature wear and eventually failure. If the pump becomes airlocked, it gets very hot and can eventually fail. About 60% of GeoFlow's warranty claims are due to air in the system or water quality, which includes debris in the system. Purging the system of air and flushing the system of debris is very important. Let's talk about air first. A small amount of air in the system is not a problem if it's under pressure, but a small bubble at 50 psi becomes much larger as the pressure drops, which occurs as the pipe expands when the loop temperature increases. As mentioned earlier, wet rotor circulators are cooled and lubricated by the fluid moving through the system. The larger bubble could certainly airlock a pump. When the pump is running dry, it gets very hot and will eventually fail. A ground loop circuit could also become airlocked, preventing flow through the circuit and reducing loop capacity. The lack of flow through one of the circuits will act like a smaller loop and could result in a hot or cold loop. Now that we've discussed the problems with air in the loop, let's talk about debris in the loop. Debris in the system can become abrasive. It may erode the heat pump heat exchanger, pump volute, or other system components, resulting in leaks or component failures. Debris can also plug small pathways or orifices in the pump and other system components. Depending upon chemical makeup, debris can even promote corrosion. The picture on the left is an example of erosion. You can see the wearing of the volute as sand has worn down the material. On the right is an example of corrosion in the system. This picture is an extreme case of debris in the system. In this case, the debris has resulted in the pump shaft breaking. Debris can be very fine. As you can see from the chart, fine sand, silt, and clay can be less than 100 microns. In fact, clay can be as small as 2 microns. When flushing the system, we typically use a 100 micron filter which catches larger particles. However, once the system is purged of air, additional filtering may be required. Filtering is very important. GeoFlow offers a 1 micron filter for additional removal of smaller particles. The 1 micron filter should not be used when purging air due to the high restriction. However, once air is purged from the system, it's a good idea to do some additional filtering with the 1 micron filter. Finally, we need to discuss the third function of the flush cart, antifreeze charging and in some cases water treatment. Most systems need antifreeze. 
The exception would be systems with water temperatures that do not fall below 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Make sure that you're aware of the characteristics of the antifreeze you're using, since some antifreezes do not include inhibitors. For example, pure methanol is simply wood alcohol. In addition, some antifreezes may not have a high enough concentration of inhibitors. For example, most brands of propylene glycol require a 30% concentration to include enough inhibitors. Some brands of ethanol may also have a minimum concentration required. Another consideration is local water quality. Some antifreezes are not compatible with local water, so a premixed solution must be used or water must be brought to the job site. However, some antifreeze brands are designed to work with local water. Make sure to check with your antifreeze supplier before using the water on the job site for the final loop fluid. If you are purging the system of air with local water, always check with the antifreeze manufacturer regarding the use of local water. In southern areas where antifreeze is not used, an inhibitor should be added. It's a good idea to verify water quality requirements from the heat pump manufacturer and flow center or pump manufacturer since it could affect warranty. The percentage of antifreeze and the type are critical for both system operation and especially for safety. Let's look at the most common geothermal antifreeze solutions. This table shows antifreeze solutions most commonly used in the geothermal industry. Methanol, a wood alcohol, is typically 15 to 17 percent by volume for proper freeze protection. Remember that most methanol solutions do not include inhibitors. Ethanol, a grain alcohol, is typically 20 percent to 22 percent for proper freeze protection. Most brands of ethanol include inhibitors. However, you will want to consult the manufacturer to determine the concentration required for the right amount of inhibitors. Additional inhibitors may be required. Propylene glycol is typically 20 to 25 percent for proper freeze protection. Most brands of propylene glycol include inhibitors, but most require about 30 percent concentration for the necessary amount of inhibitors, which is typically a higher concentration than desired, since the higher concentration at lower temperatures will result in high viscosity and will require more pumping capacity. In most cases, additional inhibitors will be required when using propylene glycol at concentrations of 20 to 25 percent. When using alcohol, safety is a major factor. Notice the flashpoint chart for ethanol and methanol. Using pure alcohol is never a good idea, as the vapors or fumes can be very dangerous. Even at a 50 percent concentration, ethanol and methanol have a flashpoint of 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Premix solutions are recommended when using alcohols for safety. Now that we've discussed the reasons for flushing the loop, let's talk about loop flushing requirements. What some may call the magic number is two feet per second velocity through all parts of the system to break free any air bubbles attached to the pipe walls. We must consider the flow rate required to achieve two feet per second through each of the loop circuits and the supply and return lines. We can calculate the flow rate needed to achieve two feet per second velocity. For example, for inch and a quarter SDR11 HDPE pipe, we need 9.3 US gallons per minute to achieve 2 feet per second velocity. However, as the flow splits between the parallel circuits, we also need to consider the flow rate through each parallel circuit to achieve the needed velocity. For example, if circuit 1 is 3 quarter inch HDPE SDR11 pipe, it will need 3.6 US gallons per minute to attain 2 feet per second. Likewise, circuit 2 will need 2 feet per second, and the same with circuit 3. The flow rate in U.S. gallons per minute to attain 2 feet per second velocity depends upon pipe diameter. As you can see, 3 quarter inch pipe needs 3.6 gallons per minute using pure water to achieve 2 feet per second velocity, whereas inch and a quarter pipe needs 9.3 GPM for a velocity of 2 feet per second and so on. Let's take a look at an example with a three circuit loop. Each circuit is piped in parallel. From the previous slide, we need 3.6 gallons per minute in each circuit. The inch and a quarter supply return lines need 9.3 gallons per minute to achieve two feet per second. 
and then we can compare flow rates to the circuits and the supply and return lines. In this case, we need 10.8 GPM to get two feet per second in all three circuits. Since the flow rate required for the circuits is higher than the flow rate required for the supply and return lines, the flushing flow rate is 10.8 GPM. This assumes a reducing header, which we'll talk about later. To achieve two feet per second, we need a flush cart that meets the flow and head requirements. According to ANSI CSA standard C448, a flush cart must have the following requirements. By the way, ANSI is the American National Standards Institute. CSA is Canadian Standards Association. A tank is necessary for air separation. That is, any air returning from the loop during flushing ends up venting to the atmosphere with an open tank as shown. A water flow meter to ensure that there is enough flow. However, the flush cart shown has a PT plug on the suction and discharge of the pump in order to compare pressure drop to flow rate. So pressure gauges may be used to verify flow. Suitable filters. We spoke about this earlier, a 100 micron filter while purging and a 1 micron filter for further removal of debris. Pressure gauges, which are helpful during flushing and for pressurizing the system if using a pressurized flow center. And finally, valves to reverse the flow. Although a reversing valve was popular early on in the industry, power flushing is used more often now instead of reversing the flow. In some cases, if the, if the loop is very close to being purged of air, reversing the flow can actually end up being a step backwards. Power flushing adds an additional surge from the local water pressure in series with the pump, helping to purge air from a loop that may be difficult to purge. A flush cart should include a pump that is capable of around 60 to 70 GPM at relatively high head to purge residential and light commercial loops. Depending upon loop design, a flush cart like the one shown in the previous slide can even purge larger loops if valved to allow portions of the loop to be purged separately. Here's a chart showing typical horse and a half and two horsepower pumps used in the industry. The GeoFlow flush cart uses the Monroe pump which has high head and flow capabilities, but can also operate on a 15 amp breaker at 115 volts. We've discussed the reasons for flushing the loop and the requirements, but we should also consider how loop header design can affect our ability to properly purge the loop of air. Here's a drawing from the International Ground Source Heat Pump Association that shows reducing headers for 3 quarter inch and 1 inch ground loop circuits. Although only 10 circuits are shown, we can add two additional T's to the left for a 12 circuit header. Typically, 12 3 quarter inch circuits is the limitation of most residential light commercial flush carts, but multiple 10 to 12 circuit headers may be used if valves are added to allow purging of each header separately. It's important to notice that reduction in pipe size as we move from left to right allows the very last circuit to be purged of air with only the flow rate needed for that circuit's diameter. If we don't reduce the header, we'll need the flow rate for the supply return lines even at the very last circuit. More on this next. Let's explore why a reducing header is so important. As we discussed, two feet per second is required to break free any air bubbles attached to the pipe walls. We also know that 3.6 gallons per minute is needed in 3 quarter inch SDR11 pipe to achieve this velocity. A re reducing header would allow us to flush the loop with 10.8 gallons per minute flow through the piping system. If the header is not reduced, we will still need the flow rate required for the supply return lines through each of the circuits as well. In this example, with inch and a quarter supply return lines, the header is not reduced, so we will need 9.3 GPM in the last section of the header. To make sure that we have 9.3 GPM at the very last section of the header, we need 18.6 GPM at the second section. That means we'll need 27.9 GPM before we start dropping off any flow through the parallel circuits. Let's calculate the flushing requirements. Now that we know the flow rate, we'll need to calculate the pressure drop. For this example, we'll use 150 foot bores and 100 foot of supply return lines in one direction. So our circuit pressure drop is 45.1 foot of head at 9.3 gallons per minute. Since the three circuits are parallel, we need only consider the pressure drop of one circuit. Each circuit, by the way, is 300 feet. Since our U-bend is at the bottom of the 150 foot bore, 
which is 150 foot of pipe on each side, making a 300 foot circuit. Our supply return lines have a pressure drop of 21.5 feet of head at 27.9 GPM. This is for the 200 total feet of inch and a quarter pipe. We can add the, press, the circuit pressure drop and the supply return pressure drop and end up with 66.6 .6 feet of head at 27.9 gallons per minute for the flushing requirements of this loop without a reducing header. Had we gone with a reducing header, our flushing requirements would have only been 12.7 feet of head at 10.8 GPM. Let's take a look at how the two designs compare on our flush cart pump curve. In the case of the Monroe pump, you can see that we can still purge air from the loop even if we don't reduce the header on a three circuit loop with three quarter inch circuits. Naturally, the reducing header would be even easier to flush. However, let's look at a larger ground loop. In a five circuit example with inch and a quarter supply return lines, notice the amount of flow needed when the header is not reduced. To maintain two feet per second velocity, even at the last section of header pipe, we need 46.5 GPM at the first circuit. Let's calculate the pressure drop for this design. The circuit design has not changed from our three circuit example, since we still are using 150 foot bores or 300 foot circuits of three quarter inch pipe. So our circuit pressure drop is still 45.1 feet of head at 9.3 GPM. However, the pressure drop for our supply return lines is now 52.5 feet of head at the higher flow rate of 46.5 GPM. When we add up the pressure drop, we now have 97.6 feet of head at 46.5 GPM flushing requirements to purge air from this design with 2 feet per second throughout the piping system. Had we used a reducing header, we would have needed only 18.6 feet of head at 18 GPM. Let's take a look at how the two systems compare on our flush cart pump curve. Here's the reducing header, not a problem with the flush cart pump curve. But take a look at the non-reducing header. It's actually beyond the capability of the flush cart. We will have a difficult time getting all the air out of the system. Had the circuits been one inch instead of three quarter inch, it would have been impossible. Imagine the difficulty with a 10 circuit loop. A short reducing header is another concept we should discuss. It's still a reducing header, but the distance between T's is less than two feet. This helps keep pressure drop down and also helps maintain balanced flow between circuits. This is a picture of a prefabricated short reducing header for a five circuit system. As you can see, the T's are very close together. So even though the last two circuits are three quarter inch, the distance is so short that the pressure drop is negligible. There are some big advantages to a reducing header. We can flush up to 12 three quarter inch circuits with a one and a half horsepower pump. It can really reduce the labor, especially with pre-assembled headers. And it helps balance flow between circuits if we take advantage of the short reducing header. Thank you for viewing this GeoFlow video. For more information, check out our website at www.geo-flo.com.